Some updates from the House floor. Representative Thomas Massey tweeted yesterday that this week I will vote against House Resolution 894. Anti-Zionism isn't anti-Semitism. The resolution states that all anti-Semitism is anti-Zionism. That is either intellectually disingenuous or just factually wrong. The most senior Jewish member of the House more problematically, the uh, resolution I, suggests that all anti-Zionism, it states that all anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. That is either intellectually disingenuous or just factually wrong. And it unfairly implicates many of my orthodox former constituents in Brooklyn, many of whose families rose from the ashes of the Holocaust. While most anti-Semitism is indeed anti-Semitic, the authors, if they were at all familiar with Jewish history and culture, should know about Jewish anti-Zionism that was and is expressly not anti-Semitic. This resolution ignores the fact that even today, certain Orthodox Hasidic Jewish communities, the Satmar in New York and others, as well as adherents of the pre-Jewish state, uh, pre-state Jewish labor movement, have held views that are at odds with the modern Zionist conception. Glenn Greenwald tweeted in response to the resolution, it's not the role of Congress to dictate to Americans which political views are and are not racist, that this is done to condemn Americans in order to protest a foreign country makes it all the more repressive. But of course, it will pass with overwhelming bipartisan support. So we just saw a clip of the you know, most senior uh, Jewish member of the House who has frankly not been overly sympathetic to pro-Palestinian protesters or shown what I would describe as kind of a, an overflow of solidarity with um, the members of the squad who have come out and done vigils for deceased Palestinians as well as Israelis and the like. But even he in this moment seems to think that this resolution, which explicitly ties and connects anti-Semitism to anti-Zionism, is a bridge too far. And the reason he, you know, states there is specifically because there are so many Jewish pro-Palestinian activists that would be implicated by this rule. Right. And frankly, even if anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism were synonymous, which I don't believe is the case. Um, what business is it of U.S. Congress to weigh in on whether Americans' speech is deplorable? Um, I would feel this way about a generic condemnation of uh, basically any kind of ism. Um, isms are bad. You can have your feelings about them, for sure. But we have the First Amendment here. And while Congress, I guess, has the right to do these kind of empty statements of moral superiority, um, I don't think it's a good use of their time. And it does start to get into, well, they shouldn't, they're should the government. They shouldn't be making broad, sweeping statements about about constitutional legal speech. It is constitutional, it is legal to say anti-Semitic things, to say racist things, to say gendered things, to say, like that is, that is your right. You don't have a right to engage in violence based on those motivations. If they wanna condemn violence, um, that's their prerogative. Yeah. Um, they should do something about violence in the jurisdictions for which they're representatives of. But um, just weighing in on Americans' speech rights is not something I want my Congress to spend any time doing. Yeah. And I'm, I'm grateful to people like Representative Thomas Massey, who is a, 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 a ideological figure kind of close to my own thinking on a lot of issues. So I'm, I'm not surprised to see him, um, you know, taking the stand at all. It's very consistent with what he said about the Israel-Palestine conflict and in general, but uh, very, very happy to see it nonetheless. Yeah, he was the only person to vote no on the last kind of version of this bill, yeah. uh, this resolution. And even Rashida Tlaib voted present on that one, not no. So he has been showing a lot of um, backbone in this regard. I mean, just as a thought experiment, can you imagine what would happen or how I think some of the folks who are championing these kinds of resolutions would react if Congress decided to say, pass a resolution saying that if you think uh, you know, trans people should identify uh, with the gender of their birth and that there are only, uh, there's only, there's as many genders as people want to be and they just tried to pass that into law. How upset people would be about it. Now, I, I personally do believe that people should identify as how they want mm -hmm. and take no issue with that. But I can obviously see that mandating that everyone take the same rhetorical view or ideological view that I have is a gross overreach that you have to question what the intent of that is. Is a resolution like this, are increasingly more binding and far-reaching um, edicts about what kind of speech is acceptable in the United States of America going to be used 
as a fulcrum for public policy, for internet censorship, for um, social media policy going down the pike? Are they going to be able to point to, well, Congress says anti-Semitism is anti-Zionism, so now Twitter is going to start banning um, people who are critical of Zionism. I mean, we've already seen us start to go down this road with the Twitter bans on uh, From the River to the Sea as alleged hate speech. How far is this going to go? Yeah, and there's tons of bureaucracies that work um, studiously to police speech on social media and in everyday life for a variety of reasons, um, for because they're hateful or because they say they're misinformation or they are against contrary to public health. Um, there's so many reasons. They don't need more reasons to do it. Um, yeah, this is just a, a bad use of Congress's time um, and a troubling trend, for sure. I mean, it is reflected, by the way, this kind of sentiment is very much reflected in the online discourse right now. As we've reported, there are a number of um, Jewish groups that have been really le leading the charge uh, on these protests, these mm -hmm. pro-Palestinian uh, protests. And the, the implication is that Jewish Voices for Peace, all of the all of the protests that are being described as pro-Hamas are substantially made out of young Jewish protesters. And I do think that that's a tipping point even for someone like Jerry Nadler not to want to um, describe these people as somehow uh, not authentically Jewish because of their beliefs. Meanwhile, three university presidents from Harvard, MIT, and the University of Pennsylvania will be called to speak today after weeks of backlash over their school's responses to anti-Semitism on college campuses, according to The Hill. The hearing titled Holding Campus Leaders Account accountable and confronting anti-Semitism will examine incidents of anti-Semitism on each of the campuses. Now, according to The Hill, Harvard and Pennsylvania have had billionaire dollars cut their funding to the schools due to their responses. Colin Rugg wrote on X, Ivy League schools are feeling financial pain and becoming desperate as mega donors are refusing to give money, according to Command Education founder Christopher Rim. Some schools have slashed the mega donor threshold by insane amounts. Rim suggested that a $2 million donation may now get that mega donor title, while the previous amount would have been around $20 million. Um, and I am, to be clear, I am happy to have people stop giving money to elite universities. I don't think elite universities are, um, are uh, uh, sympathetic recipients of tons and tons of money. Um, I don't like their policies. I don't like the world they're creating. Um, and many of them tried to get, engage in, ex and did engage in like explicit discrimination on racial grounds for people applying to the schools. So um, I, I don't know that, it, it, I think it's interesting that this was the bridge too far, um, it, the, tolerating some level of, of uh, anti-Israeli activism on campus, but um, I, I think they were asleep at the wheel for a long time. Um, I should mention, uh, because we've talked a lot about um, violations and censorship of pro-Palestinians' um, speech rights on college campuses, which I which we've condemned and should be condemned. Um, I have now seen a couple examples of censorship of pro-Israeli um, voices on campus. Um, there was a professor, uh, I wrote about this last week. Uh, his name is John Strauss. He's a professor of economics at um, USC. And he was in like a viral moment uh, with some uh, anti-Israeli protesters where uh, he's Jewish and he started arguing with them. And, and he, he, said, he said that he thought all of Hamas should be killed. And they clipped it, it got clipped, as if he was saying all of the Palestinians should be killed, which he said absolutely was, is not a view that he, is not something he would say and not the view he holds. And he was suspended and told he couldn't come to campus and then had to teach his classes remotely. And e even though it's, it's, it's clear, I mean, frankly, even the anti-Palestinian statement would have been protected speech, but that's not what he said. So they should not be disciplining him. And I've reached out to them for comment and they are, they're saying, no, it's, well, you know, we're just looking into it. But yeah, while we're looking into it, he can't set foot on campus. Yeah. Well, uh, I do think that part of the concern here is that while all of these claims uh, should be investigated, the big, the most severe kind of act um, of, I wouldn't even call it censorship, I'd call it rank violence and terrorism, has been directed at the three uh, students of Palestinian dis descent who were literally shot, and one of whom uh, is now paralyzed from the chest down, uh, Hisham Ar Ar Artani. Uh, and so we have this scenario where three kids speaking Arabic with each other, wearing kifiyas, seem to have been targeted on the basis of appearing to be Arab or Palestinian specifically. Um, and now one of them may never uh, walk again. And it does seem like there's a little bit of an asymmetry here in terms of kind of the national level of focus. We've had endless stories about college censorship. And so far, 
very little media attention, not just to those three men, th- those three young men who were recently violently, brutally assaulted, um, but the young six-year-old about a month ago who was stabbed to death and his mother stabbed and injured by a neighbor of theirs who specifically referenced um, this idea that there was going to be a jihad that he had heard about on right-wing media and then decided to take matters into his own hand and kill a child. So I do, I would only push back and to the extent that I think there's a bit of a pr- proportionality uh, issue happening here. I, I don't know about that. I hope the perpetrators of those violent acts, you know, go to prison for the rest of their lives and should be, and regardless of what their motive, I'm perfectly willing to believe the motivation was um, anti-Arab or anti-Palestinian or anti-Islamic, um, regardless of what the motivation is, um, people who commit violent crimes should um, should face the absolute consequences for them. They were really awful and terrible things to have done. So more rising right after this.